Hello and welcome to another video in the Statistics for Proteomics video series. I'm Will Fondry, and today I'm going to be teaching you about Receiver Operating Characteristic Curves, or ROC curves. Let's begin by answering the question, what are Receiver Operating Characteristic Curves? Well, they were first used in World War II for the analysis of radio signals, which is where they get their name. However, they're used to assess the performance of any classifier at completing a binary classification task, where a binary classification task is any task where you're trying to assign an element to one of two classes. Now, there are all kinds of situations in mass spectrometry proteomics where uh, these types of binary classification tasks uh, come up. These are a few that I thought of. For example, does this patient have this particular disease? Or is this tissue cancerous or not? Or do these two proteins interact or do they not? And in all of these cases, you see that there are two options uh, to select from or two classes. Now, you've probably seen ROC curves in many papers that you've read. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, how to interpret these ROC curves. But first we're gonna look at how we uh, create one using a simple example. We're then gonna talk about how to evaluate them. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some of the caveats uh, for interpreting ROC curves. So let's begin with our simple example. We're going to try and predict whether a patient has a disease from the abundance of a single protein biomarker. And so we're gonna pretend that we have measurements from 20 cases, uh, 20 disease cases and 20 control samples. And this is what our data might look like, where the blue dots here are our uh, disease cases, the orange dots here are our control cases, and their location on the x-axis indicates the protein's abundance. And as you can see, in general, it may, uh, the data looks like if you have a higher protein abundance, it's more likely to be a disease case than a control. Now the question is, how well does our biomarker perform at uh, determining whether a patient has this particular disease or not? So sensitivity and specificity are two useful metrics that we can use to begin to assess this. Now sensitivity is the proportion of positives that are cases, the blue dots here, that are correctly identified as cases when we threshold at some protein abundance value. Specificity is the opposite, where uh, it's the proportion of negatives or control uh, samples here that are correctly identified as negatives or controls. Uh, again, when we threshold at some protein abundance level. So how do we calculate the sensitivity and specificity of our assay? Well, we begin again with our data. And here we're going to choose an arbitrary threshold, uh, in this case, three on our protein abundance axis. Now we've divided our, all of our samples into those that have a protein abundance higher than three and those that have a protein abundance lower than three. The ones with the high protein abundance, we're gonna call the positives. We're gonna classify as positives. The, one, the ones with lower protein abundance, are, we're gonna classify as negatives. And this classification now yields four different types of data points in our data set. We have the uh, disease cases that were correctly classified as positives. And these are going to be our true positives. We have the control cases, or the control samples that were uh, incorrectly classified as positives. So these are gonna be our false positives. On the negative side, we have our disease cases that were, inc that were incorrectly classified as negatives, which are our false negatives. And we have our control samples, which were correctly classified as negative, which are our true negatives. Using these four uh, types of data points, we can calculate our sensitivity and specificity. For sensitivity, uh, we calculate this as the number of true positives divided by the total number of positives in our data set. And so when we actually do this, uh, we get uh, 14 divided by 14 plus six uh, yields a sensitivity of 0.7, which is pretty good. Specificity, likewise, is the number of true negatives divided by the total number of negatives. In this case, it is 17 divided by 17 plus 3, or 
Now the question comes, how do we choose a threshold? Here we chose an arbitrary one, but how can we choose one in a more principled way? Fortunately, this is where ROC curves come in. ROC curves show the sensitivity and specificity across all of the thresholds we could select in our data set. So here's what an ROC curve begins as. We are plotting the, on the x-axis, one minus the specificity, which we also call the false positive rate. And on the y-axis, we're plotting the sensitivity, which we can also call the true positive rate. I'm going to refer to the x-axis as the false positive rate instead of one minus the specificity for the rest of the slide. So what we're going to start by, start by doing is choosing a threshold that is higher than any of the data points in our data set. When we, when we choose this threshold, we see that we have a sensitivity of zero and we have a false positive rate of zero. And so we can plot that point on our ROC curve. We can then lower our threshold such that it hits the first uh, data point in our data set, in this case, a disease case. And so when we use this as our threshold, we correctly classify a single disease case as a positive. And so our sensitivity increases and our false positive rate does not increase. So we add another point for this, uh, for this uh, example. We can then keep lowering the threshold, adding more and more points as we go. As we lower the threshold, we'll then hit our first control sample, which when we classify it as a positive, will yield our first false positive uh, classification. This will lead to a kink in the ROC curve when we plot that point, as it increases the false positive rate, but doesn't increase the sensitivity. We can then keep lowering the threshold to every data point in the data set using every possible threshold. And when we plot all of those points, our ROC curve takes shape. Here we see that the, uh, the ROC curve increases in sensitivity while decreasing in specificity as we go along. Now typically, folks don't plot every point. Instead, they only plot a line that connects the points. And this is the ROC curve that we're familiar with. Now importantly, the ROC curve illustrates a choice that needs to be made between achieving the most sensitive the highest sensitivity for our assay, and balancing that with specificity. And the exact balance between the two will differ based on the application you want to use it for. So how do we actually evaluate ROC curves? Here the dashed line represents the, the performance that you would expect from randomly guessing. So poorly performing classifiers, um, or in our case, poorly performing biomarkers, will yield a uh, ROC curve that is close to, closer to this um, y equals x line, or this uh, dashed line. More generally, we can uh, gauge the performance of a classifier by looking at the area under the curve, the area under the ROC curve. Uh, and this provides an overall measure of performance. Here, the area under the curve is 0.87, uh, but we could imagine testing another protein biomarker for the same disease, one that works better, and we might get this orange curve, which has an area under the curve of 0.98. And here we would be pretty confident that this, uh, this other biomarker, the orange curve, is going to be better for our assay than the one in the blue. Now there are some caveats to, doing, uh, to using ROC curves in your analyses. One of those is that ROC curves can be misleading when classes are imbalanced. And by imbalanced, I mean when you have more in one class than in the other. As an example, let's imagine that we had only five disease cases and 95 controls in our data. We might collect data that looks like this, where we have our five cases here and all of our controls here. And we could plot again plot an ROC curve that might look like this. And for, at first glance, this would look like we have great performance. We might choose uh, this point here as the threshold we want to use uh, for our further analyses. However, if we look at where this threshold falls in protein abundance on this plot, we'll see that we have four of our cases correctly classified, but we also have four control cases incorrectly classified. This means that half the discoveries that we make using this threshold are going to be false positives. And depending on your application, uh, this may be unacceptable. All this to say, 
there are many other metrics we can use to evaluate our classification performance. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them uh, in this lecture. However, I would highly recommend looking at this article uh, in Nature Methods in part of their Points of Significance series about classification evaluation. In particular, one of the things uh, you'll want to look at are precision recall curves. And with that, I'm going to close. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy more videos in our Statistics for Proteomics series.